it's good to see everybody who has made it through a um, intense period of feasting. Um, my daughter, in addition to that, decided that she had to take the meaning of the word shop until you drop to the nth degree and uh, decided to punish herself by participating in the Black Friday. And uh, yes, on, on Thursday at midnight and uh, and she very graphically described how one in, uh, comes and engages in the shoving and yelling and elbowing that is necessary to enjoy the shopping experience. And uh, that sounded just absolutely marvelous. And I thought, hmm, I need to do that sometime uh, when I'm 95 maybe. We are uh, thankful in all things. Um, at, at our Thanksgiving, which was a bit of a uh, shindig, um, I read from Psalm 100 and it just took a couple of minutes to ask people why is it important to give thanks? And so, of course, I got the nice theological explanations, biblical explanations, that it's right and proper because God deserves thanks. And I thought, yeah, okay, I can handle that. And then I thought, okay, how about we put it in plain English in words that everybody can understand. How about something like, if somebody gives you something, what do you do? You say, thank you. And does God give us things? You bet. And do we need to pause every so often and say, thank you, Lord? Yes. Um, and then one person came up with what I thought was absolutely brilliant and sensible explanation, that giving thanks also serves a very profound purpose for us. Did you think about that? Why is Thanksgiving important for our personal welfare and sanity? Well, think about it this way. Things happened, and, and I won't use the more colorful expression, um, and we tend to get very negative, and sometimes it feels like everything is piling on us, and Thanksgiving simply requires us to pause and to recognize that maybe, just maybe, there's a different sort of reality taking place, i.e. that God is in control, as was mentioned earlier. And so Thanksgiving is a spiritual discipline, and sometimes it requires a discipline. Because when we get up in the morning and we haven't had a good night's sleep, and we're cranky, and we had a fuss with a member of the family, then the natural tendency is to quetch. You know what quetching means? <laughs> and um, giving thanks means that you begin the day by saying, God, you know, you're good. And you have given me all sorts of blessings. And I want to stop and give thanks for, for those things that I can remember and notice and observe and I want to give you credit for it because the credit belongs to you not to me or somebody else and as we do that then we recognize okay uh, maybe just maybe things aren't as grim and uh, uh, dark and negative as we started out thinking Thanksgiving is something that is spelled out in Scripture as something that God expected the people of Israel to do. Uh, in fact, as we concluded the fall cycle of holidays, remember that one of the last 
uh, festivals was Sukkot, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, that was, among other things, a celebration of the conclusion of the harvest and remembering as well God's faithfulness and, and mercy as the people of Israel slept through 40 years in the wilderness and uh, a time to pause and say, God, you somehow kept us through all of that stuff. And if you haven't done that, let me encourage you, by the way. This is on a, um, a mounting the soapbox here for a minute. If you haven't done that lately, let me encourage you sometime today, tomorrow, soon, to pause and say, God, you have kept me through all kinds of stuff for which I give you thanks. Why is that so important? Because then it reminds us and that's the other aspect of Sukkot. It reminds us as well that God is engaged with us, that he cares and he has the power to keep us going, not just today and tomorrow, but the day after. And so because we pause and remember what God has done in the past, then we're able to say, okay, God, somehow you've managed to take care of us in, in the past you somehow can manage to do that in the future. And so, by the way, as if you know American history, you know that the uh, Puritans had a terrible, terrible winter. They almost, the whole lot of them died from starvation. And they planted corn. They had a very uh, bountiful harvest. And the governor, uh, Governor Brantford, organized the a feast and inviting uh, invited a number of um, the Native American uh, neighbors to celebrate with them and uh, perhaps you may not be aware of the fact that these Puritans were Torah observant now they were not Torah observant in the same sense that we are the best of my knowledge, they didn't have a Torah scroll, but they were very, very, very much focused on, on the Torah, the Law of Moses. In fact, one of the leading ministers um, of that colony, of that community, wanted to have the Law of Moses, the Torah, um, be the pattern for, for the laws of, of the community of Massachusetts. Um, I think they have gone a bit of a distance from those days. So, uh, quite likely that our celebration of Thanksgiving is connected to Sukkot because the, the Puritans took what they read in, in, in the Pentateuch, in the Law of Moses, where they were told after you have a, a harvest, you are to bring the the fruit uh, of the harvest and you are to give thanks and to rejoice which is what they did so thanksgiving is something that we do once a year however i want to encourage you to consider that as something that you do more than once a year it helps with sanity because it helps us put things in perspective you know life gets intense Sometimes gets a little mishugi, er, and um, it's hugely important for us to remember that maybe, just maybe, God has a plan. And by the way, the word sovereignty refers to a couple of basic ideas. One is that God has a plan. B, that He has the power to carry out that plan. You know, you and I can sit and come up with all kinds of plans. I was going to date myself by talking about using a yellow pad and forgetting that, that we have a number of folks who are um, somewhat beyond that. But in any event, um, God has a plan. He works out the plan. And it's hugely important for us to remember that. And part of the short-sightedness that we have, we assume that nobody in human history has had things as difficult as we do. 
You ever feel that way? No, I'm the only one. And so when you read, when you read um, letters like Paul's letter to the Colossians, in, which is in uh, modern Turkey, we forget the fact that here is a guy who is old, I mean really old, older than I am, um, and he was chained. In all likelihood, he was chained 24-7 to the guards of the imperial uh, elite, uh, to the soldiers of the imperial guard. Now think about that. I mean, this is called house arrest, but reality is that it isn't as if Paul had all kinds of freedom to do whatever it is he felt. And these believers in Colossae also had to deal with all kinds of challenges, among which was the fact that there was a wad of spiritual and religious confusion that was taking place in, the, in, in that city. And so part of what, what we see Paul doing is he's challenging them here as he's challenging other people not to be overwhelmed and bamboozled and confused by what's taking place around them, but rather to press forward. And this is very much a challenge for us today because we see all kinds of stuff around us and sometimes it frankly gets discouraging slash depressing, you know. Um, open the paper and some, some person somewhere in the United States undertook to bring a gun and shoot a bunch of people or you have that in, in the Middle East. And yet somehow you're given the ability not just to hang in there and grit your teeth and persevere, but you're given the ability to press forward and, and uh, accomplish kingdom fruit or kingdom uh, productivity in the midst of all of that, which is what the Lord expects you and I to do. So there's a secret, and the secret simply is what we do so little of, and that is prayer. I mean, we talk about prayer a lot, some of us. Um, but how much of it do, do we put to practice? These early believers prayed, and they prayed seriously. Uh, they didn't just dabble in it. They prayed. And so for us, perhaps part of the picture is we don't recognize what prayer is about, what takes place when we pray. And to be perfectly honest, sometimes we feel like prayer is a waste of time. <gasps> I know no one here will ever stand up and say that. But think about the implications. Think about the priorities. Where do you invest most of your time and energy on a given day and a given week? Where does prayer fit within that? And yes, you can look at me and say, you are the, the spiritual dude. You, you know, you, you, do, you get all this wonderful salary for, for praying and so on and so forth. Um, however, has the Lord not called us to pray? We see that in Yeshua's example. And we, by the way, just to remind everybody, we've been called to be Yeshua clones or Yeshua's disciples. In other words, the way He is, we're supposed to be, not in the sense of getting crucified, but in the sense of doing what He set out to do. And what we see over and over and over again is that Yeshua was a praying man. We see that in the very beginning of His ministry, that when He was immersed he was praying, and heavens opened, and, and uh, the, the, the Spirit of God descended, but, he, but Yeshua was praying. And we see that at the very end, three years later, what is Yeshua doing? He's praying. 
obviously in the place called Gethsemane, got Shemen, the um, oil press, and then everything in between. And what you may or may not realize is that in Scripture, what you have sometimes is these uh, literary sandwiches. What do I mean by that? Um, what is what I, I mean by that is that you begin with a statement and then you have all kinds of things in between and then you conclude with a statement that's very much like that. So that means that everything that's in between is supposed to relate to these first, the first and last statement. So for example, you have the very beginning of Yeshua's ministry, the fact that he prayed. He prayed, you have at the very end of his ministry, the fact that he prayed. So that means that prayer was a major part of his life. And as you read, you see that over and over and over and over and over again, particularly in the book of Luke, where it speaks about Yeshua praying. So a couple of verses, a couple of statements. One of those days, Yeshua went out to the mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. This is Luke 6:12 before he selected the disciples, uh, which by the way included Judas as well. Um, then of course you have the mountain of transfiguration where Yeshua takes, uh, take, uh, takes Peter, John, and James with him. He goes up to the mountain and what does he do? Does he sit there and take pictures? No, he, sit, he sits there and he prays and as he prays, his face becomes transformed. And then you have all kinds of other examples. Um, after Yeshua fed the multitude, um, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Why, think about it, why did Yeshua pray so much? You say, well, duh. Maybe. Think about Yeshua's statements. What he, what he told his disciples simply was, I can do absolutely nothing unless I see what the Father is doing and what I hear from him. Which means that he had to be in continual contact, continually listening to what it was that the Father wanted so that he could do that. So if that's what Yeshua did, guess what? That is what you and I are also supposed to be doing somehow. Now it's highly unlikely that we're going to all go to the mountain and spend all night in prayer. However, what it tells us simply is that prayer is a crucial, needs to be a crucial part of our life. Because there's nothing that you and I can do for God or have God do through us unless it is somehow related to prayer. Luke 18, Yeshua told his, disi his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. How many times have you prayed for something for a need that you felt was absolutely crucial and then you ran out of steam. You just gave up. You pray, 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 pray and you say, forget it. God is not listening to me. Or, you know, you've heard the standard shtick. Maybe uh, God says yes. God says maybe. God says no. Well, I don't know about you. I don't find that terribly comforting because if there is a need then what Yeshua tells us is you pound the door. You say, Lord, we're desperate. And yes, we understand the, the fact that it has to be according to God's will, but if we know who God is and the fact that He cares for us and He has some specific things that He wants to do in this world, then we tune ourselves and point ourselves in that direction and say, Lord, I want to move in that same direction. And, and we know that when we pray, that the Lord will hear us because we're, in essence, telling Him what He wants to hear. 
And so Yeshua prayed over and over and over again. And he tells the disciples to do likewise. And by the way, Paul gets it. And yes, Paul was a very active kind of a guy. He went here, there, and there, and everywhere, and, and established congregations, and, and uh, led hundreds of people to faith in Yeshua. And yet, Paul had the same basic perspective. Unless I'm in strong, tight relationship with God, Unless I, as Yeshua put it, unless I abide in the vine. In other words, unless the pipeline from God to me is open and clear and stuff is flowing from God to me, there's nothing of any consequence that I can do. As Yeshua put it this way, without me you can do zip. So that means that somehow in the process, in our relationship with God in life, today, tomorrow, the day after, we somehow understand the fact that prayer needs to be a bigger part of our life. And this is not about Jewish guilt or Gentile guilt. It is simply the fact that we get the fact that prayer has to be more and more greater and greater part of our life. And we point our nose in that direction and we say, God, I need help. I don't know how to go from here to here. So, by the way, we see the same kind of sandwich uh, in Colossians. In other words, emphasis on prayer at the very beginning, emphasis on prayer at the very end. So, in chapter 1, we see that Paul says, We pray, i.e., he and those who are with him in, in prison were praying. We always pray for you, and we pray that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. This is Colossians 1.3. And then here, today, in chapter 4, Paul says, not only do we pray, but you guys need to pray. And furthermore, the word that he uses, devote yourself to prayer, doesn't mean one of these casual, okay, Lord, I, I'm getting up in the morning, and uh, all right, bless this food, and... Uh, uh, bless my family and keep the crazy people from smashing into me on I-25 and uh, uh, make sure I don't get fired from work and etc etc no folks prayer is part of our love relationship with the Lord as Michael mentioned earlier Do we want to grow in our love relationship with the Lord? Then we want to grow in our ability to pray. Devote comes from the Greek word that has to do with continue and be steadfast despite difficulty, distraction, and hindrance. Have you noticed that there are times when you say, I want to do something for God, i.e., I want to grow in prayer, guess what happens? Then you have a sleepless night, then you wake up in the morning not feeling very good, and you're grumpy, and you say, okay, God, yes, I know, I said I want to pray, but uh, respectfully, uh, let's try that uh, tomorrow, the day after. There are all, there's all kinds of what in physics is called inertia, uh, bodies in non-motion tend to stay in non-motion. And so the choice for us is simply to say, do I want to grow as a man of prayer, as a woman of prayer? Or do I want to remain basically like a spiritual couch potato? And being devoted means an investment of time, investment of energy, investment of strength. And you can look at God and say, God, I don't have it. Now, been there, done that, have several t-shirts like the rest of us. However, that's a pretty lame excuse, isn't it? Because if God has Boku's strength that he can give us, don't we want to say, Lord, I need that strength to persevere, to press forward, to continue, to grow. I don't want to be here 
in the same spot a year from now as I am now. A year from now, I want to be over here. I want to grow in getting to know you and being more productive and bearing fruit because I know that this is what you've called me to do. Yeshua said, you didn't call me, but I selected you so that you will bear fruit. And not just a tiny amount, but lots of fruit. And not just fruit that comes and goes, but fruit that continues, that remains. How do we get that? We get that by strength from the Lord. And God challenges us to be strong and courageous. And if we don't have the strength and the courage and the wisdom and all that, we come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need it. I need that strength and courage because I want to head in that direction and I am your basic couch potato right now. I don't want to remain in that state. And yes, we all have busy lives. And yes, we all get distracted. And yes, we look at a verse like 1 Thessalonians 5.17 and we say, I don't get it. Pray without ceasing. Now what on earth does that mean? None of us live on a desert island where we have the option, the, the possibility of praying all day long. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, at least to me, when I think about praying without ceasing, it at least involves a little bit of uncluttered time where we sit, sit down with God and have a conversation. It doesn't have to be an hour, two hours, five minutes. Where we sit down and, and kind of go over the day with God and say, Lord, here I am. I, I want to serve you. And would you give me what is needed to serve you today? Begin with a few minutes, if, if that is all we can muster. Then we look for opportunities. All of us have space, dead space during the day. Um, so instead of engaging in road rage, we can perhaps have a conversation with God. Wow, what a concept. And again, if you really want to grow as, as a woman or a man of God who is praying, you ask for it. You say, Lord, I want to go there. I don't get it. I don't have what it takes, but you do. So, please supply what is clearly lacking. And, folks, be a, prepared for the fact that in all, likelihoods, in all likelihood, as you move in that direction, all of a sudden, all kinds of obstacles and challenges would crop up that you have never considered. Inertia is very difficult to overcome, or let me put it this way, it's impossible to overcome unless we recruit the master of the universe to engage with us. So, how much are we interested in becoming people who pray? Choices we have to make, folks. And at Yeshua Tzion, we talk a lot about prayer because we've learned over the years that unless we pray, nothing of substance gets done, folks. And this is not to minimize anybody's contribution, anybody's hard work, but nothing of any substance will take place unless, or unless we are committed to growing as people who know how to pray and who are wanting to grow as prayers. Again, remember that the one who's writing all this is someone who has already lived a very fruitful life and who is in prison. 
And he's not sitting back and saying, okay, God, you're done with me. In fact, what's interesting, in the letter to the Philippians, he says that it's become clear that throughout the, um, throughout the, the guard, the people who have been guarding me, all kinds of people are getting to hear about Yeshua. Why? Because they look at him, they say, Paul, why are you here? Well, you're clearly not a, a mafioso. So he has an opportunity to share. And he's been doing that. In fact, he looks beyond the time that he's incarcerated. And that's part of what happens as we learn to pray. God opens our eyes and gives us a bigger vision of what he has for us. Then he gives us holy chutzpah to press forward and continue and, and not just persevere in a sense of <sighs> hanging in there, but persevere in, in terms of breaking forth. Paul says to these Colossians, pray that I will proclaim the word of God clearly. Now again, you want to say, what? Why, does he, why is he asking that? Here's a guy who, who preached and taught from, from this place to that place. Um, but Paul, as articulate and brilliant as he was in several languages, knew that nothing of any substance would take place unless the power of God was at work in him. And folks, for us who are up here every Shabbat, that's a very, very, very deep conviction. We know that unless God speaks, that Rabbi David and I and others are doing nothing more than flapping our gums. And so this is something we encourage you to remember that, that the Lord wants to stretch you and, and teach you to grow in your relationship with Him, especially in this area of prayer. And just a couple more minutes on, on what Paul is asking. He is asking them to pray for Him that He would be able to communicate the mystery of Messiah. Now what does the mystery of Messiah mean? Obviously there are lots of things that it includes because it included the mystery of Israel um, coming to know the Lord at the end times. It includes um, Yeshua's return. However, the mystery of Messiah folks has to do with one basic reality. That is that Yeshua came that he died for our sins according to scripture, that he rose again according to scripture. And you and I can talk to everybody and their mother about this, that, and the other. You know, and if you are a Bronco fan, you, you can mourn along with those who mourn this time of year. <laughs> but seriously, and, and you can talk about Hebraic roots, about how Yeshua was Jewish, and you say, okay, well, I think I get it. Or you can talk about the fact that he's brought us together as Jews and Gentiles. I get that too. And at Yeshua Tzion, we live that reality. Our leadership is Jewish and Gentile, and everything that we do, we endeavor to do as one size fits all. So we get the mystery of how God brings Jews and Gentiles together, but the mystery of all mysteries is the fact that God is able to grab people and save them and bring them out of the muck. That's the mystery, folks. That's what Paul is asking people to pray for him, and that is what we ask that you put somewhere at the top of your prayer list for us as a congregation. 
that God would equip us to broadcast the mystery of Yeshua, especially as we consider the possibility of a move. And again, it is a possibility. And if God opens the doors, it, it may take as long as a year and a half just to get to where we have a building. But if this is what, what the Lord has in mind, then we are willing to say, okay, God, we're, we're interested and committed to do what it is you have for us to do. And by the way, uh, the Jewish community has been moving south and east twice as fast as any place else in Metro Denver. So we're waiting to see how that will play out. And we ask for your prayer. And as Rabbi David mentioned earlier, please, please, please give us your input because we need to respond sometime in the next couple of weeks. So pray. And if you feel that prayer is not your specialty in life, ask God to help you. Make a commitment to be a year from now farther along in how it is that you pray and communicate with God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We bless your name. You know us intimately. You care for us. You know our ups and downs. We thank you, Lord God, for the challenge that you give us to become men and women of prayer. We ask, Lord God, that your spirit, your ruach, would stir us and, and give us, Lord God, the desire, the passion, Lord God, to learn to pray, to learn to lay hold of you and come to know you, Lord, as we make those times. Pray for each one of us, Lord. Cause us to recognize your work in us. We ask, Lord God, that you would give us the grace to respond and do what it is you've called out for us. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. We'd like to ask that you take a few minutes and reflect on what you've been hearing throughout the service. And either do that in your seat or come up and pray with one of us.